Yep, it's a handheld shaky cam video kind of day. I'm gonna have to try to stabilize this video. So, I had planned on doing a board review and a driver review this week, but that took a little longer than expected. And I thought, you know, why don't I put a video showing some of the issues that are inherent with doing those types of videos and the types of roadblocks you can run into. Not only might that get me off the hook a little bit, but I personally think it's fun to look at the behind the scenes stuff, you know, like warts and all and see how things actually go. So I figured rather than putting no video out and just saying, ah, it's gonna have to come out next week, I, maybe I'll do this just for funsies. So this started out innocently enough with just me wanting to do a review of the TMC2209 in the silent step stick format. I'd gotten some for Vatarat, and then recently I finally got my delivery of the TMC2209 from Big Tree Tech that I ordered off of AliExpress. So I figured, hey, maybe I can do what we call in America a twofer, as in two for one deal, etc., etc. Anyway, bang them both out in one review and compare and contrast. No problem, starry-eyed and naive me thought as I soldered up the boards. I'll just grab the new Marlin, I'll reconfigure it for my mutant DIY printer, and then maybe I can plug it into the new version of the SKR and get a three-fur out of it. Or maybe I can compare and contrast that with the SKR Mini and get an unprecedented four-fur. So sweet, got the Vatarot step sticks, got the Big Tree step step sticks. <laughs> But then I noticed something, wait a minute, these two boards aren't anything alike. So that was the first snag, not all boards are created equal. But that's fine, choice and variety is a good thing, and maybe they optimize them to work with their new boards somehow. Thankfully, Big Tree Tech has been hopping on the real open source train these days, so Jishi for that, we at least have something we can compare with Vatarat's files, which they've always had as open source, so don't shame to them. But that brought me to snag number two, which is that the diagrams for these boards were not the same. They showed a different size in different orientation. So open up GIMP, do a little reconjoitering here, flip the board over, flip all the labels over. This took like probably 10 minutes, but you know, whatever. Add a little label to it and voila, we have an amazing graphic to use in our videos. Which led me to the realization that we may have a problem with form factor here, because as you can see, our index and our diag pins are not in the same place, as well as our PD and UART and spread pins, which exist on one and not on the other. So here's the revised pin match showing the correlations and disparities between the one driver and the other driver. So a choice was made on the part of Big Tree Tech to not break out the spread cycle pin and instead put that on one little solder jumper node. And then the choice was made by Vatarat to give you a choice of pins that you could connect your PD and UART to. So that means with the Vatarat boards, you can toggle spread cycle or uh, stealth chop on and off via a GPIO pin or a jumper or something like that. While in standalone mode, the Big Tree Tech, the uh, spread cycle comes stock from the factory and you would have to change the jumper if you wanted to change that in standalone mode. Also, the PDN UART and the Diag pins are in different places, and they're inverted, so that means I would have to take one of my Vatarat boards, flip it upside down, and do some modifications, probably on the SKR board, in order to get the non-Big Tree Tech drivers to work. Thus putting a kink in both my 2 for and my 3 for plan simultaneously. But, if you noticed what I noticed when I flashed up the last schematics, you win the Sherlock Holmes Award for sleuthy sleuthfulness. Yes, that's correct. The Microsept jumping setters are completely different. Big Tree Tech shows 2, 4, 8, and 16, while the Vatarat boards show 8, 16, 32, and 64 with interpolation, and the Big Tree Tech does not specify whether interpolation is toggled on or not. So I looked at the previous documentation, and uh, that agrees with the Big Tree Tech boards. All right, so we have two that agree with that. However, when I look at the Big Tree Tech manual for these, that agrees with the later documentation of the Vatarat boards. So we have a split decision, two on one side, two on the other. Two twofers, you might say. So let's go to Trinamic and they can be the freaking tiebreaker and figure out what this is going on so I can get on with my life. Well, apparently the pins are dual state, not tri-state, so we do only have four choices and those are eight, 16, 32, and 64. Which I figured untied this whole spaghetti mess that we had going on of agreements and disagreements, but then I had a brief heart attack when I saw that the pin assignments for ground and VIO were completely different. 
Fortunately, I also noticed that just the designations in the columns for MS1 and MS2 were reversed. So anyway, back into GIMP now so that we can get some agreement with the data sheets. So flippity flapping those over the other way. Now we have complete agreement between the MS1 and the MS2. MS1 on the left, MS2 on the right, ground, ground, voltage, ground, ground, voltage, voltage, voltage. Cool. Then I noticed that my favorite mode was missing, which is four times micro stepping with spread cycle and 256 times interpolation, and I died a little inside. But anyway, it's fine. You art, thought I. That can solve all the problems because we can access the other modes. Ah, you art. It's actually been a few weeks since I checked on you art support, so it's time to put the Sherlock Holmes hat back on and check out the progress. Now I know that the guys over at Fizetiket, they added uh, software wire support for these so that they could run them on their little boards. Reviews coming. And I also knew that these had single wire UART, like serial UART as opposed to parallel, so that you could use fewer pins and then address them using the uh, jumpers. And I knew this because many of the boards that are coming out with these drivers on them are using that very mode. So I had to check and see if that software configuration was available in uh, Vanilla Marlin or if that was just in the pre-installed firmware, so I had to go over and check the Trinamic drivers also and make sure that they were working. That means paying a visit to the ever helpful Timidlet, Tima, Tamalet. So that means paying a visit to the ever helpful Tamoshanter and seeing what the deal is. Hey Alex, that's not funny turning somebody's name into a malapropism. Tamoshanter's killed my dog. Relax, it's just a joke. But there's your vocab word for the day, malapropism. Anyway, so I went over to GitHub, checked out the code, and it seems like all the references are there in place. Whether they work or not, it remains to be seen, and there was much rejoicing. Next big time suck. So, a little bit of story time here. A lot of people get really nerdy with the trinamic drivers, have what I am going to call post-traumatic debugging disorder. And I am among those. And I'm going to put this in the Mo Choices, Mo Problems category. Or as it may be morbidly referred to in the product development world, giving the user enough rope to hang themselves. It's just a ratio of factors that you have to balance, like simplicity versus flexibility and usability versus user preference, etc, etc. So you could just have one button that's do the thing, and you hit it and everything works perfectly, and that's great. However, you may want to do different things, so there may be options that you would long for there. Fast versus slow versus long versus short, etc, etc. Now, if you program the do the thing to do the optimal thing for the most users, you might say like, okay, fast to slow ratio between a four and a six, whereas a power user might be able to crank it up and still get great results, and you might have fringe cases that need to lower it down. So these guys up here, they're fine with tweaking and fiddling and balancing factors and all that kind of thing. But the bulk of the people who we'll call normies, they just want the stupid thing to work when it's supposed to be working. Now, the Trinamic Silent Step 6 give you a whole lot of choice. And an open firmware that's programmable by the user has a whole lot of choice. So essentially, you have an infinite amount of rope with which the users can hang themselves if they don't know what they're doing. So we got to where people were having a lot of problems with like overheating and layer shift issues and things like that with the Trinamic drivers. So you end up with this big dumb cycle where like the users are blaming the firmware and the firmware is blaming the hardware and the hardware is blaming the drivers and everybody starts looking at each other suspiciously, not thinking that they're doing the thing properly and it just becomes a whole big crazy mess. Obviously, the hardware and the software people want to make sure that nothing is going wrong on their side, so they put out a giant poll of as many users as they possibly can and try to look for correlations. But in an open source community where everybody kind of has equal voice on whatever forum you're speaking on, and it's tough to tell the informed power users from the normies who are just freaking doing something wrong, it's very difficult to take that information and parse it into anything useful. So you had poor Scott and Roxy and Tama Shanter and Bob and everyone else over at Marlin and all the users scrambling to try to figure out what was going on. And I myself did a buttload of testing with designs that I called various types of Trinamic killers. So part of the thing that we like about Trinamics is that they have real-time diagnostics. So it sets certain flags under certain error conditions, such as overheating, shorting, open connection, things like that. These can be thought of as fault conditions or error conditions. The only thing is, is it implemented, that's probably spelled wrong, and is it accurate? Can you trust it? But you might have somebody who says, hey, I'm obviously missing steps and that's leading to layer shifts. Well, the internet says you raise your current because you need more 
torque, but that could lead to an over temperature flag, which can lead to a chip shutdown. So you add active cooling and raise your current. Then you still have shifting layers. So because these people have heard all of this, just raise the current from the internet gurus, they think, hey, enough current equals enough torque and enough cooling means it must be a problem with the firmware or the driver or the hardware. But our diagnostics are only as good as what is implemented. Are there any hidden flags? Are there flags that we're not using that were just poorly documented? Are there unimplemented flags that we could add? Yeah, I probably spelled that wrong too. What if adding more current doesn't just add to over temperature and causing shifting layers? What if it has to do something else? So here's our stepper motor. When we change directions on that stepper, we get what's called a spike in EMF. So motors are actually generators. If you turn them back the other way, you can generate electricity. Most of the time, we're leading a signal into our driver, which leads a signal into our motor one-way communication. What happens when you change directions all of a sudden? Well, at that point you get a large spike and that's being fed back into your circuitry. Is there a flag for that? Well, no, it turns out they tie some of these flags into other flags in their dual use and it's just not very well documented. And I know this because I harass Trinamic about it. So one of the cases that I found with a lot of these users was that let's say you have your four lines leading from your driver to your motor. You have your motor V plus and you have your ground, right? So let's say you have a signal that's going to trigger, trigger a temperature shutdown, but that's shared with an over voltage or over current shutdown. In that case, you could, for example, be running perfectly acceptable temperatures and the act of turning up the current is not causing the temperature shutdown because of excess temperature, but that flag is actually shared with one of the other parameters. So what do you do about it? This has nothing to do with the hardware in particular or the software, but what you want to do is limit that back EMF to a range where it's clamped to either the V plus or ground or whatever the trigger signal is for the hardware. And that's something that manufacturers could build into the board, or you could build into the design of the silent stick step itself, or you could just drop one of the silent step stick protectors on there because they have output clamping on it. So my recommendation to users that were having these problems was first do all of the proper setups. If you were still having those troubles, turn down the current a little bit. See if you were missing steps. If you can't turn it down to the point where you have enough torque, turn it back up and use a silent step stick protector board to clamp those voltages and see if it goes away. And for a lot of people that helped. And I verified that with this highly scientific, very expensive test equipment. And by Trinamic's own admission, an additional problem is that some of their modes of operation had problems with highly dynamic behavior like we sometimes find at high velocities. So they introduced revised versions of these, which may or may not solve the problem, which means I'm going to have to make more Trinamic killers and try this out. There were also microplier issues with velocity changes, so they had another thing to test. But why do I even mention all this? Well, it would be incredibly useful if in this new generation of drivers, we had warnings for things like that. One of the problems we have with a lot of these stepper drivers these days is they're not meant for highly dynamic motion like 3D printers. But Trinamic has been addressing that. And as you can see from many like high speed pick and place machines, which also use steppers, they can be organized to be very fast, very precise, very accurate. Pretty much the only parameter they have control of in standalone mode, which the majority of people are actually using, is that they can increase or decrease the amount of current, but we don't have any particular warnings for, hey, stupid, you're using too much current, or hey, stupid, you're not using enough current, other than anomalous behavior. So in light of that anomalous behavior that cost hundreds of person hours of research and lots and lots of frustration on the internet, I thought, you know, Trinamic in their wisdom probably included that in this new iteration. Well, no, it doesn't look like they did. Nope. We have a metric ton of reserved blank bits here you could use. Come on, guys, you have 13 extra bits and you can't throw an overcurrent flag in there, an overvoltage flag. But that was just another thing that I had to check out. Now my PTDD is kicking in and I really want a ginormous slice of pizza from Lorenzo's across the street, but I can't because I just got off my meds and I have to lose the weight, so I'm on a diet. So fruits and veggies for me. Oh! Also in this picture, 
Yes, that is yet another blue pill. So I figured, hey, I could use that with this highly expensive test equipment and get a five fur or even a six fur because I use a skilloscope. All right, all right, I'm done with the two for jokes. Ooh, no, wait, a seven fur because I can use this little thing too. All right, I'm really done this time, I promise. Oh, but the Sherlock Holmes of you might have noticed some little scribbles I had above that board in the previous picture. Well, that brought me to the next time-wasting thing, so pull up some carrot sticks and tzatziki sauce, and I'll explain what's going on there. You see, that all has to do with Arduino's digital write command. And the reason that is important is because I like to do complete reviews of things. If I'm going to bother doing a review at all, it's not really my bag. I like the techie stuff, and the regular reviews are best left to other channels with more charming and charismatic people. So there's a certain characteristic of stepper drivers that may become important in the very near future if it has not become important already and I just haven't seen it on the forums because I've been hiding in my little room doing experiments this whole time. And that has to do with how quickly and how well at certain speeds these drivers can accept a step signal and then turn that into a driver signal for the motors. This wasn't an issue before because we were using very low clocked 8-bit microcontrollers that are, you know, slow and bad at math. But we're moving into the 32-bit world now and we have much, much higher clock speeds and much lower overhead on a lot of our commands thanks to the 32-bit architecture versus 8-bit word length and all that nonsense and shift registers and moving things in and out of memory. And I think I already did a video on that, so I'll stop there. And some use cases have managed to exploit that to very high pulses per second. Example is this chart from Clipper firmware that shows the PPS that are achievable with particular boards that have particular series of processors on them. Uh, PPS is just pulses per second, which can also be referred to as hertz, which is cycles per second. So I may use them interchangeably. Sorry about that. Anyway, back to the clipper chart, you can see that as compared to like our 16 megahertz AVR 8-bit chip, we get absolutely trounced by the newer chips like the ones on the Big Tree Tech XKR Pro, which are the SCM32F407 that also I think has an FPU, the Adafruit Metra, etc, etc. So it looks like we are rapidly approaching 1 million pulses per second, but is that actually useful with the step sticks we have? And is it useful in step direct mode versus our UART or um, SPI mode? Since those are digital and therefore not subject to the problems of the analog pins. Well, I mean, they're digital pins, but they're actual physical pins. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Because I think that's very useful information to include in a review, particularly if somebody is looking to the new stuff to use with their new setup. Because not only can these trinamic chips take a smaller PPS and interpolate that into 256 steps, you can also drive it natively at 256. So why is that an issue? Well, let's say we're running regular old like Prusa i3 specs and we have 16 times micro stepping with a 20 tooth pulley. That means we have 80 pulses per millimeter. And we remember that single stepping in Marlin, at least in 8-bit processors was limited to 10,000 pulses per second or 10,000 Hertz, which means you have a maximum speed of 10,000 divided by 80, which is 125 millimeters per second. I mean, you go to double and quad stepping over that, but that makes Trinamics very angry. So whatever. But we're in crazy clock speed, crazy interrupt speed territory nowadays, ladies and jelly spoons. So let's say somebody puts together like a really fast Delta or something like that, and they additionally want to drive that at 256 native steps. Well, we're not talking about 80 steps to the millimeter anymore. We're talking about 1,280 steps to the millimeter. Of course, this doesn't work for Delta. I'm just using the Prusa style as an example. So let's say you have a speed freak and they want to move 500 millimeters a second with native 256 times stepping. Well, they're going to have to pump out 1,280 steps times 500, which means 640,000 pulses per second. Try to pump 640,000 pulses per second in one of these suckers and see what happens. I'll tell you what happens. It's going to cry. But what can you do with the trinamic? Well, 
it'd be helpful to know these things, but they don't really post it. It's not a definite thing. I mean, they do say that your maximum full step frequency is your F clock, your clock frequency divided by 512. Fine. We also add in the minimum step time, the low time, the high time, the setup time, and then also the time for the um, analog filtering on the input. So clock, I don't know if they mean internal clock, if it uses external clock, if it's using whatever clock Marlin's using, whatever. Anyway, they have this table right here that shows you like choices of PWM frequencies. And I don't know that at least tells us what the internal clock is at 12 megahertz. So does that mean 24 kilohertz is the maximum input frequency? Because that's 12,000 divided by 512. Or is it on like the 16 megahertz clock, which would mean it's a 31K? I mean, I know some of their other drivers have examples where they're running up to 256,000 pulses per second, but I don't know what mode they're running in. I also am not sure what timer they're referring to, the crystal timer, the MCU timer, the actual software timer, timer, real time clock. I don't think we're feeding it an external timer from our firmware, so I imagine they're using the 12 megahertz internal clock. Forgive me for not knowing, but if anybody wants to jump in in the comments and say yes or no, let me know. I couldn't find exact matching clock terminology anywhere, and I didn't feel like reading thousands of pages of code in the drivers, the firmware, and the data sheets to find it out. But I'm not alone in timer naming convention confusion. Try running on your Arduino, delay microseconds 5 on a Arduino Mega, or delay microseconds 100 on a SAMD51 and see what you come up with. I'll give you a hint. Unless they change the bug, it's not 5 and it's not 100 because they worked off a subdivided clock. So microseconds 100 under a SAMD is 33 and on the Atmega it's like 1.5 microseconds. Anyway, that leads to digital write latency and overhead, which is the crap that I had scribbled on my desk right here because I needed to know which board was dependable and not going to throw off my measurements and which one was quick enough that I could get decent times without having to go to direct port addressing and things like that because life is too short and I just want to write a freaking sketch and have it work. So that led to another time sink. Here were the candidates, the Mega, the Uno, the SAMD, the SAM with the FPU, the ESP32, the STM32F1, and the STM32F4 with an FPU. Sorry I didn't invite NXP to the party, but they were the last ones into the Arduino clubhouse because they wanted to do their own thing, and their logo makes my eyes hurt. Anyway, I was pretty sure the Mega and the Uno were going to be too slow for this, so probably cut them out. The ESP32, I don't think it has a soft wire library yet, so if I wanted to test the UART stuff, I couldn't do that. And these were the results that I got for the chips overall. That leads the SAMD with the FPU and the two STMs with times under one microsecond. Now, if you remember to my previous ramblings, those SAMs with the FPU were having problems with the timing, which is exactly what I had to do. So that leaves the two STM32 F series chips. And since both the figures were under one, I just went with the STM32 F103 blue pill. Now, this was my extra credit time wasting. Let's say we have our signal coming into our driver chip. I need to, let's put a heat sink on that driver so that my drawing doesn't catch fire, except that now it totally looks like it's on fire. But anyway, we need to make sure that that input signal agrees with our output signal. Don't have to, I could just see if that's separate turns, but I'd like to do that. Well, with the cheapy oscilloscope that I'm going to be using for this example, I don't have a current probe and I don't have a differential probe and I don't have an isolated AC probe. But what I do have is ferrite cores and I have magnet wire. So this ferrite cord has spiky edges on it, so I figured I would have to go ahead and wrap that up in tape. You should probably use something thinner, but you know, screw it. This is just a little DIY thing. Having done that, it's time to wind our toroid. Oh, Alex, you have a toroid winder, I hear you ask. Nope, nope, no I don't. I did totally start designing a 3D printable one several years ago, but I never even got around to doing the initial test prototype, so yeah, shot myself in the foot with that one. But it's better than spending several hundred dollars that I don't have on a freaking probe, so I'm just going to thread this through by hand, old school style. Well, that wasted another 20 minutes. Alex, you have the patience of the saint, I hear you say. Nope, no I don't, I need constant distraction. And that's mindless work, so I read a paper while watching a video of Limor trying to sell me microprocessor boards that I really can't afford and listening to the new Tool album. Anyway, so I whipped out the $10 Automagical tester and I found out that the inductance is 2.83 millihenries. Is that enough? I have no freaking idea, but at least now I have a frame of reference. I'm guessing no, but we'll see. 
and I need to rind a primary on this anyway, which is usually just a turn or two of wire. So I'm just going to use this regular wire to put it through, strip the ends off, put the hot connectors on it. So that way I can use it as an interrupt for the configurations that I have to do that. Boom, problem solved. And there she is in all of her janky glory. Alex, why don't you just use a Hall effect sensor, I hear you ask. Well, those are all taken up in guitar pickup testing jigs, and I don't feel like dismantling those or waiting for one to come in the mail, so... <laughs> all right, let's hook our janky probe up to our janky oscilloscope and see what's going on. Seems to get a reasonably clean sign, but then as soon as we start changing the frequency, it goes all cross-eyed here. Actually, it looks like crossover distortion. That's supposed to be a triangle wave, obviously not. This is a square wave, question mark? Square-ish. At least you could tell it's supposed to be a square. Anyway, screw it, we'll just do that live. Back to the silent step sticks. Now, we already said they have their RC filter on the pin input. They also have their additional delays that are tied into it for um, the, the uh, signals, the hold time, the on time, the off time, etc, etc. And while this scope has a couple hundred kilohertz bandwidth, I wanted to see if it was fast enough to do some practical examples. So I ran a whole bunch of tests with just some Arduino sketches and verified them with um, the Sigrock uh, Pulse View app and a Logic Probe and found out that it's pretty okay-ish up to the maximum that it says it does. Anything above that is a freaking nightmare. But I got my processing loop down scribbled down some useful values and used a one microsecond processing overhead on each of the high and the lows, which seemed to do the trick. Although for very small values, I guess there's some loop overhead as well, because it seems to be an additional 0.1 microseconds, but whatever, fudge factor. God have mercy, what am I doing with my life? Anyway, if you're interested in how fast the blue pill will do its digital write with the STM32 Duino libraries in the Arduino IDE, it appears to be 500 kilohertz. That's without any direct port addressing or bit twiddling of any kind. You can go much, much, much faster if you need to. Then I had to put together a test jig for the Trinamic driver, so I sorted through my stuff until I found a 24 volt supply. This was one that I dug out of the trash, so I don't know what this used to be too, it doesn't really matter. Wired that all up to a board, and does it work? Tune in next week to find out. I'm kidding, I wouldn't play you like that. So here's the initial power up. I filmed it so if it was a fantastic explosion I would get that and be able to share it with you. 5 volt appears to be working. No, not 5 volt, 3 volt. And blam, high voltage. And there we go, we have signal. So I don't even remember what the initial setup was measuring here, but we have our motor spinning. That's a good thing. We just have absolute garbage on the scope, so had to fiddle around with that a little bit to try to get anything reasonable out of it. And it appears as though whatever I was measuring was about 31, 35 kilohertz, something like that, with this rather ragged waveform. But I suspect that's probably just for this crappy transformer, and I'm going to have to look for an alternate method if I want to get anything accurate. But I'd call this a 90% success because A, I didn't blow anything up, B, the code works, and see we actually have our stepper spinning around so I can use this for the testing when I eventually get to it and that doesn't even get to like the new stall guard and all that kind of nonsense and I'll have to write a completely different sketch to deal with like the UART and see what the uh, maximum PPS is there and finish peeling through all the driver code and that type of stuff to try to make heads or tail of it like PWM frequency is that a hexadecimal number 0b01 that means it's 2,817. Don't worry, everybody. I got it figured out. It's 2,817. I have no idea what that means. So that's the tale of why the video didn't come out this week. And I have to stop right now because I have to clean up later on today for the live stream, which is tomorrow, Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we will be unboxing and evaluating an Ender 3 printer, hopefully also assembling and maybe even printing. See you there.